this is Coffee Number 5. I'm your host, Lara Schmoisman. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Coffee Number 5. My coffee is ready, as always, and I'm always getting a little cold because I do 100 things and I keep sipping away from my big cup. <laughs> uh, anyway, today, uh, I've been talking about visionary. People sometimes tell me that I'm visionary. I think I'm an early adapter many times because I am not afraid to try new things. Like, for example, when I started with this internet world, uh, I would say late 90s, and I was young, but I was really an early adapter. Not only was using the internet, I was dreaming how I can use the internet which that it was very unique back then. And I see the opportunities and I see how someday, because back then it was impossible that my background in radio and in television can be connected with this internet world. And you know what? We're here already. And you're going to be listening to this po podcast because that technology became possible. And But at the same time, we, this internet world became data driven which it's insane. We can learn so much from what we do, but we also, we can learn from data in anything we do. So today I have a special guest for you. I have Cindy Marshall. I had the, we are together in a, a community, Women in Retail, and I had the, the pleasure to talk to her a while ago and she was so insightful and she had so much knowledge about the retail world that I said, I have to bring her to the podcast. So here we are today. Thank you so much for being here, Cindy. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So, Cindy, give us a little bit story of where you started, because everyone started somewhere. It's something sure. that you wanted to do, retail. You want to, did life take you the place that you thought you would be in? It's interesting because I actually did study marketing and advertising in college. Uh -huh. um, but I never expected that I would be in what I call the multi-channel retail space, direct to consumer. Um, but that's really what happened. At, at age 16, I was behind the service desk, desk at Sears and Roebuck at Montgomery oh. Mall in Potomac, Maryland. So I did get my first job was in retail, but I ended up spending a, um, I spent my first five years of my career in publishing where I worked for um I launched some magazines, Ultra Sport Magazine and Bicycle Guide. And then I worked for and launched the, the Walking Magazine. And then I worked for Inc. Magazine. And that's really where I cut my teeth on the analytics and direct marketing. And then I went and spent a decade at retail stores and catalog companies. So working yeah, because for- Because that's how we started. Everything right. started as a catalog. A catalog, right. So I worked for a company called J. Jill and- they're still around today and I ran their marketing and we had four different titles. So that was quite fun. And then I worked we, for- We were talking uh, a while ago with one of our guests. I wish I could remember who it was, but it, they started in Yellow Pages. Oh, did they really? That's so funny because we just got a Yellow Pages yesterday at home and we're like, really? Does anybody really even have a phone number anymore? Like why? <laughs> yeah, well, apparently people do if they still yeah. print them. But okay, so you became, uh, today you are a consultant, you work with incredible companies too, and you find it, it's very interesting because you have the experience on retail, but also in digital retail, which is there are completely two different worlds that at the same time, they are united. I think they're one and the same. So um, just to finish on my background, because I spent yeah. a decade in catalog and retail stores, and then I added digital to the mix for 10 years where I worked for different brands like Vermont Country Store, Performance Bicycle. And what I think is if you have a retail store, you're still targeting the consumer and you want to drive them into the store. Um, and so it's very similar to the digital world, but you the customer can't touch and feel it. So you've got to figure out how you're going to give them that experience online. And it was just a different media to drive people to the website versus drive, driving people to the store. And for a long time, the retail stores um, is where everything was at. And now it's really more a showcase for your online business. And yeah. believe it or not, people are still using print to drive um, traffic to digital 
Yep. Because it's fifty uh, percent of the people may opt out of your email, so they're not you can't reach them. But also because of the cost of PPC. Yes. Many PPC. times it makes more sense to spend time time in another mediums and create different brand awareness to go to your website. Yeah, and I love catalogs because I get ideas. I keep my stacks of favorite ones, and it's kind of like the magazines used to be. But um, yeah, so I, I, I digital marketing is just evolving so fast, and that's the thing that each of us running in as a consultant. I've run this business for twelve years at Shine Strategy, where we're fractional chief digital officers and chief marketing officers. And we've got some technology experts and some um, executive coaching um, that we're just adding to the mix. But um, we've seen inside over 50 brands and it things just aren't the same for every client or brand. Um, how you're, if you really need to know the customer and be able to match that product to the customer and make it relevant. And, and that you know, really gets into the customer database world. Absolutely. Uh, so today in this world that you are mixing the world of retail, that people need to go on digital because it takes a completely different skill set. You have to how to run a store. You have people fittings. Uh, it's that you have to have two different themes uh, to work on it. Correct. Like so, store operations is very different than digital operations in e-commerce. <laughs> That's yes. very different. Um, and I'm not an expert in store operations, but I do understand how to get people into the store. How, and, so how do you get people into the stores? Um, so I ha I do use radio, believe it or not. Radio works really well. I use a lot of um, local media on Google. So um, local search, depending mm -hmm. on the region. Um, I use CTV and OTT ads, which actually work really well. Um, and then the email. I mean, email is a huge driver. And I will use direct mail, um, especially if I can't reach people through email because not everybody's subscribed. So I'll use post. Well, tell me a little bit about that piece because it's something that is not very usual that brands still use direct mail. What do you feel like there is a difference of getting something uh, tangible and and how do you find those addresses? How do you get to that customer? How do you get well, it? So the direct mail is a push vehicle. Um, so I'm not waiting for somebody to come to me. I'm actually finding you and pushing it to you just like email. But email, you've either signed up and you like the brand and you've ordered from me. But after you order, you might unsubscribe, but it doesn't mean that you're not a customer anymore. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't hear about what's going on. So the direct mail, you can, if they're on the, I would start with the first party data, the people that are on your list that have opted out from email. And what I do is create audiences that I put into Facebook ads and Instagram ads because they're not gonna see you through email. So they don't know. And yes. then I'll go to direct mail. Um, I would actually model them against the cooperative databases, the Epsilon and Oracle databases and under find out if Cindy Marshall's household is a big spender or a small spender and then figure out if I want to spend that money to get a postcard or a flyer to her. Okay, so let me ask you, okay, so I'm very, so this Oracle uh, databases, how do you get to it? And what kind of companies can afford this? Um, the cost is anywhere from 55 to 75 cents per name, and um, they will do the modeling for you. Mm -hmm. It's called a cooperative database. A lot of times they want your names. Um, you need to give them your zero to 24 month buyer file and put mm -hmm. that into the database. But it's all um, blind, so you don't know who's in there. But if I'm selling, um, bedding and rugs, and I don't want my competitors to have my names, I can block them. So I can say, here's five companies I want you to block. But what happens is they're build models and come back and say, based on your very best customers, I can find other customers um, that are very similar. So I could go after just the top 10%. They may find a million names and I could say, here's a hundred thousand customers that I could actually market to. 
and try them with a, a double postcard or a trifold, depending on what you're selling. I see. And, and how do you see, can you get metrics or how this advertising that it was sent uh, to homes? Work? Um, yes, you do a matchback, you do a computer matchback. So you know the name and address that you've sent to. And then once the order comes in, you're matching it back. Mm, interesting. And then, yeah, there's a whole attribution models that can do matchbacks. And how how do you in can do you have any examples that you can show us that this this technique really works? Oh, I I've used it to build tons of brands over the years. Yes, it definitely works. It's um, become more expensive because of paper and postage, so you can't put. Um, a 56 or 64 page catalog in the mail for less than a dollar anymore because it's so expensive, but that's people are changing up the offer so that they're putting a, a less expensive piece in the mail that will give you a taste of the brand. Hold Do you one. think I'm going to show you some because I have them. Do I think mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see some of my pieces that are in my mailbox. These are all catalogs. Yes. Um, <laughs> but no, my so my question stuff. is, do you think any company can create a... A direct mail piece? Yes. There, yes. And any company at any level or just a company that is um, big enough or they have so many uh, email uh, addresses because oh, these systems, Oracle and the other ones that you mentioned, have a cost. Um, yeah, but the cost is um, they will do the modeling for free. Okay. And then they come back and tell you, and then you test it. So if they come back and find 100,000 names, I would test um, maybe 20,000 of them and do different offers and maybe do something like this, which is a trifold versus a postcard versus, you know, some companies can't afford the bigger pieces. But so if, how, if how you're you, just, it depends you what you're trying to do. What conversion rate you get from selling these mailers? What conversion rate? Yes. Well, so first of all, it's going to get the traffic to the site and then you can retarget to them. Mm -hmm. So you can identify there is identity tools that will tell you of if I mailed 100,000 people, how many of them actually visited the site? And then how many viewed a product, then how many put it in the cart, then I increase my abandoned cart emails, and then how many converted. So it's not all about just conversion and getting the order. It's about building the brand awareness. That, and that's, 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 I'm, I'm all about the brand awareness. Everyone who listens to this podcast know how important it is. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I want it's really important to know this is working. These people are coming to the site. Correct. They, so... But you, you're it's multi-touch media. So I would, I, I would then try to collect their email address and get them on the email mm -hmm. file. Um, I would. Some people use phone calls to call them up and welcome them. Yeah. And then, um, the Facebook ads, you would do that at the same time. Yeah. And so you look at the whole campaign and was it successful? And I've had so much success. Um, it's the free. You can't just do it once. You've got to do it at least three times. Yeah, you have to be consistent. And that we talk about that. And it is something that I always talk to my clients about, that um, consistency is key. But I'm okay. so happy that you're here and we're talking about even we, I don't think we ever had a guess that we talk about print catalogs or print postages, or we talk about even phone calls to welcome them. Right, so this is a company called Me and M that's out of England. And their catalog continues to get bigger and bigger. They're mailing into the U.S. They have, are now opening stores in the United States, but they mm -hmm. have about 12 stores in the U.K. Um, they're one of many companies that, like Bowdoin is another one. That's a company I worked with for eight years. And our business started as a catalog business. And then we built the digital. Um, but somebody like me and M has taking a business from the UK that has stores and marketing to the US because the population's bigger. And they've been doing it very successfully now for at least six years. 
That's very cool. That, that's yeah. very cool. So what's in the process? Because you say, how do you select what items will resonate better in a mailer that in a promotion online or using the same? And when you say you retarget, you want to have the same products that people will see or you will choose different uh, products and you choose more people to see the brand being the same? Um, It depends on what you're selling and who you're going after, but typically it's the best sellers that you would put in your direct mail piece and the best sellers that you would put on your campaigns for um, Facebook and um, your product listing ads. What are your top product listing ads in Google? Um, so there could be some of those items, but what's selling, like what's hot right now, what's selling well for you? Um, those are typically the things that you would, put out on your campaigns. Very cool. What other innovative techniques did you use outside the box? I always think about what else can we do? How can we help our clients to be unique and to be seen, wow, I didn't see this before. Um, I use a lot of companies to identify the um, traffic that's not logged into the website. So if if I'm already know your brand and the website recognizes me and I'm a first party um, visitor, 20% uh, maybe you're going to identify 20% of the people that have come to your website. But I like to get that up to 60% by mm -hmm. using um, identity tools that can identify um, maybe I've got five email addresses as Cindy Marshall and you're only recognizing me as one, but you don't really know that it's me. Um, other identity tools can I can find Cindy Marshall and market to her if I put something in my cart. Um, and then people that have browsed or visited, you can um, identify them as well. But if somebody, you wanna make sure that you're not remarketing on the email front, unless you've gotten that opt-in or, um, they have an intent to purchase. I see one of the biggest challenge for small and medium uh, companies or starting companies is to get that lead, to get that email address. So what mm -hmm. are your uh, recommendations? How do you get those email addresses? The best way to get the email addresses is through, believe it or not, surveys. Um, I used a company called Jebit who does this really well. Um, what's your home design style? Is it contemporary, modern, classic? And you answer the question and at the end, um, you put in your email to get a discount. And so you get engaged. So that typically works really well, but you also um, need to be conscious that don't serve the pop-up right away to somebody that just comes to the site. Wait till wow. they're three or four pages deep on the site and then um, offer them something to sign up why should they sign up for your email if they don't sign up then the second or third time they're back to the site you want a modal to pop up and something else to say to say i've seen you before but i'm going to give you a break for a little while so you don't want to reserve that same pop-up to the same customer until you've given them a little bit of a break yeah you want to give them a little bit of time to fall in love or to be interested Correct. in the products yeah, but there are different ways of doing it. One could be the pop-up, one can be a modal that comes in from the side. And um, yeah. But how do you get, I mean, we talk about meta ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Uh, how do you make those ads attractive for people to, because that's a huge challenge to get people to click in that ad. No, it is. But I, I guess I, the most successful meta ads that I've had are um, product ads that are the best sellers that you can just scroll through, shop now, boom, be done. That's getting right at the conversion. But if I want them to sign up for email, um, you've got to give them a hook, some way to get them in. Give us an example. Give us a taste of what's that hook. Um, so it's, uh, let's see, it's Victoria Beckham's birthday today. So okay. I would have them run an entire campaign it's Victoria Beckham's birthday. She's offering 20% for you. Sign up today. I mean, that's that's kind of like... I know, but not yeah. every, every brand is Victoria Beckham. Right, I know. So, but if people don't want to offer a discount, then um, give them some type of free 
uh, it's not really a cookbook if you're into the gifts. I mean, you, some people can offer a free item. So something that you want to give them as a gift with purchase or um, some free item. Yeah, but that has a cost also. Yes, that's true. That's a, it's, it's hard when people are starting smaller companies or like what, what I found lately is that a lot of companies out there, they put all their plans to create uh, their products, the offering, even their website, but they forget to make a plan and a budget. And like, I always call it a su sustainable budget so they can because it's not going to happen in one month. It's not going to happen in three months. This is something that has to be consistent. It has to happen over time. Uh, yes. I mean, thank God, because that's a way we also evaluate how people are reacting to our product. And they can we can change and tweak things. Correct. Like but sometimes it's worth it to be able to give away uh -huh. um, a discount to get that email address. So if the email, if you take your annual revenue and divide it by your number of email customers what is that email name worth for you yeah. so if that email name is worth twenty dollars then you should be able to give away twenty dollars to get that name so what a lot of people don't think about is how to be build what i call a 12-month buyer file oh please many, explain that i love this so how many people buy in the last 12 months so what happens is if you have a 35% repeat rate. That means 65% of the people are not going to come back next year. So if I have 100,000 buyers and only 35 of them buy again, then that means I still need to put new names into my file the following year. So it's an ongoing thing. So it's about new customer acquisition. Mm -hmm. And I look at, I break out the file into a one-time buyer, a two-time buyer, and a three-time plus buyer. So if you're buying within a 12-month period or your lifetime three times or more, you're going to be more valuable to me uh -huh. than somebody that is um, only buying once. So what I want to make sure I'm doing is communicating to the people that are buying at least two times or more so I retain them. And then I want to get as many people that look like those two-time and three-time buyers into my prospect funnel. And that's why direct mail is so good because you can find those names. Epsilon and Oracle will actually model the people that are going to buy this blouse from, this is a mint velvet blouse from England, actually, and they market into the US mm -hmm. that I'm actually wearing. So they go into the Epsilon database and they say, here's our 12-month buyer file, and here's our top customers that are three-time plus buyers. Find me more of them. And then they create a prospect pool, and you can actually market to them digitally through meta ads. So you can create audiences. Yeah. Okay. How about using lookalike audiences? How do you feel? That's about what those are. They're lookalike audiences, but through the cooperative databases, because the cooperative database says... This customer is active and she spends over $1,000 a year in apparel versus this customer that only spends $100 a year in apparel. But this customer who spends $100 in apparel may spend $1,000 in home furnishings. So she'd be better for somebody like Annie Selke. So let's say that you have a new client. It's a company that you need to start from zero. Mm -hmm. Where would you start them? Um, what I would start them with is uh, some meta and google ads so i would start online first with mm -hmm. um google ads and then uh and so your product listing ads we know are 80 percent of the google i would make sure that um, i'm getting some uh affiliate traffic as well for my backlinking mm -hmm. and i'm um building out my um, search engine optimization by getting yeah, back do you have a, a recommendation of budget that you will allocate for ads um, I do it based on the economics of the business. So um, to, if I'm selling a $250 item, it's very different than selling a $50 mm -hmm. item. So I want to look at how many buyers do I need to hit the revenue? So if somebody spends $100 a year and they're buying twice a year, that's $400 
um, I mean, sorry, $200. I'm thinking four times a year. So if somebody's buying, spending $100 and they're um, placing two orders a year, that's $200 per customer. And if I want to get to a million dollars, I'd say this is how many buyers I need. So I would back into that and figure out what, what can I afford to spend to get a new buyer? Then I would very carefully test the different pieces. So way back when, um, when the dot-com world took off, I did this for a handcrafted goods business that had never been online. And um, we tested everything under the sun from outdoor advertising, national magazines, um, direct mail, um, email and affiliate. And of course, building the email, we needed to get people to come to the site. So the affiliates helped that. But direct mail is what took the business from 300,000 to 10 million in a year. That's amazing. So that's, that's, that's an incredible data uh, to put out there and to think, uh, to tell this business, there are other ways, even though that's why I always say that we are an omni-channel. And when we talk about omni-channel agency, I'm not talking only about doing, I believe in print. I believe in all the mediums. Mm -hmm. Even nowadays, we have amazing technology just to get even television ads by IP. Yeah, and I think that I can reach people on, um, like I use a tool called Mountain, M-N-T-N, to do my TV advertising. And they will take our lookalikes, create lookalike prospects, they create buyer buckets, yep. and we'll go out to um, the top media channels. And you can play with your budget and say, I'm going to spend 20000 this month to 50000 that month to 100000 depending on my return. Um, but you have to test everything and find out what I, works. I love that you're saying that to test. I always recommend my clients to start smaller. Yes. And first of all, to, to see the response of the ad, I like to do IV testing too. But also I like to get um, to understand that we're hitting the right audience. Correct. So that's the whole key. So some companies... Um, I won't name the brand, but there was a company that was really big into golf and they just repositioned themselves and they look like Brooks Brothers. And I'm like, why would you do that? Because you had a customer that was very much followed you because they played golf. Um, so just because the product designer wants to redo something, you need to make sure that's what the customer wants that you already have, unless you're going to try to alienate that customer and go after another one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and this is a lot. I've seen this a lot uh, with brands that they are mid. When things are not working, the first thing is they say is, let's rebrand. Let's change everything. Right. And maybe the problem wasn't in the rebranding. Maybe the problem was in how you were, the audience that you were targeting. Or the product. Or so the, Well, the product too, obviously. But, but if the product can go stale, so I know another company that did really, really well for the longest time, they were very, very popular. And then somebody new came in and wanted them to look like another brand. They lost their entire customer base. And now they've gone back to who they originally were. And so that's the thing to make sure that the product is what the customer wants. So you got it. Like when I was at L.O. Bean, we had a um, I launched a women's apparel business and we had a customer advisory board and we met with them twice a year and then quarterly after we found that it was so valuable that um, to make sure that what we were developing was what they wanted. Um, but a small customer advisory board of 25 women, you know, you can do that online now with bigger groups yeah. and influencers and um but there is something, I, I love everything we're talking. I mean, I can geek out about this for hours. <laughs> but something that um, it's, it's imperative is after we implement all this, that we analyze the business and we analyze as a business as a whole. I mean, as a marketer, I can make marketing suggestions, but there are a lot of things that they are not marketing decisions, that there is a right. business plan de decisions. And I feel like a lot of companies are confusing those. No, it it is all one. It, and you have to look at the economics of the business. And I have worked with um, some brands. It gets harder if you're selling a 50 
dollar item because you got to sell a lot of them to make the money, but that means you need volume. But if you're selling a $2,500 watch, you don't need as many. So it, it all comes down to how many customers do I need to make the money to be profitable? So now let's figure out how to build that customer list and test 10 different things. Okay, this one worked really well. This one didn't. Let's roll out the ones that worked. And now let's test five more things. And so it's a stepping stone so that after you learn what works, you just turn up the dial. And what happens is a lot of people are afraid to turn up the dial. Yeah, agreed. So there is any new technology that lately you are saying, wow, this is new. This really surprised me. And I feel like it's changing the, the way I do things. Um, I think there's, yeah, I think that some of the customer data platforms like the, um, the bloom reach, those things are, they're phenomenal because you can do so much in the one-to-one -one. and then like blue core does a lot with, um, um, going after your repeat buyers and trying to create, a, a you know, a high frequency customer and understanding when you're going to lose that customer and how to get them to that second purchase. So, tying the product to the customer. Um, trying to think of some of the ones that, um, I mean, there's the email identification companies like um, OpenSend, they're doing some great stuff. Foresight that was bought by Merkel, but you have to be a bigger company to work with them. Um, trying to think what are some of the ones that are, um, We'll, we'll put all this in the in the chapter notes for the, the to the audience to to be able to find them because I think that they are great tools. And many businesses are not using it to identify their audience and to connect with their audience. Um. Yeah, the retargeting of postcards, so direct mail retargeting, so the visitors come to the site. And then you send them a postcard and they get it within 24 hours. And believe it or not, you get a 300 to 500 time lift. Um, try before you buy. I think that's really powerful. I'm trying to think what else. The CTV I mentioned. Um, of course, you know, SMS, everybody's doing yes. text marketing now. Um, well, these are great ideas. And and the, what is great? Uh, the is the live shopping was, you yes. know, took off for a while but um yeah that's not as powerful I think as it started out to be yeah well everything is changing and I think that people are getting overwhelmed with all these platforms and all these different places that mm -hmm. you need to go in order to shop so I think it's fantastic that you go to the cons consumer Yes, I go to the consumer. And then I think, I mean, I haven't done the podcast advertising that much. Um, it's expensive. Um, display ads are once you're established, I feel that's top of funnel. It's really not the bottom. And, you know, having an affiliate program, it's not all about coupons. It needs to be around content that can awesome. work really well. And, and because Google has taken over, you know, 80% is all, um, organic search, you want to make sure that you are building backlinks to build your authority um, and that your feed, your product feed, because most of the organic search now is the product listing ads mm -hmm. that Google's going to serve, but they typically, I don't think serve them unless you're spending on paid search. So you've got to have the ranking to, and go after the terms that you want to own. So I want to own white blouses um, or I want to own um, colorful rugs. What are the terms you want to own? Then start building content and backlinks to get you to become that authority. And as you start okay. ranking and tracking that, then- yeah. And, and that's, that's always like what we talk about is about the foundation. When you're building your business, when you know what you're selling, when you know who your audience is, you put those core keywords that- Mm -hmm. gonna, you can rank for who you are and who you're going for. Correct. Cindy, thank you so much for having coffee with me. This was fantastic. <laughs> thank you for so much for being uh, so honest and open and sharing all this information that our audience, I'm sure they're going to appreciate it. 
Oh, you're so welcome. It was really a pleasure. And thank you, Laura, for having me in here. Okay. And to you guys, I will see you next week with more coffee number five. Talk to you soon. Find everything you need at larashmoisman.com or in the episode notes right below. Don't forget to subscribe. It was so good to have you here today. See you next time. Catch you on the flip side. Ciao, ciao.